Good evening, CHBC family, and also a good evening to anyone uh, who is tuning in. A warm welcome to you, and uh, a trust that uh, God has something for us to hear tonight in his word. It's always so important for us to be hearing him in every season of our life. So we come to his word tonight uh, to hear from him. Uh, before we read uh, the passage tonight, it's helpful uh, just to remember the context. We're back in our series in 1 Corinthians, and just a few weeks ago we were in chapter 8. Now, what we are seeing at that point is the Corinthian church are coming apart at the seams. They are self-imploding. In chapter 8, Paul had to deal with a very specific issue uh, the Corinthians uh, flaunting their rights, and they were flaunting their right to eat food that was sacrificed to idols. Now, in that context, in the city of Corinth, food sacrificed to idols infected and invaded every part of their every part of their lives. Uh, whether you're at a wedding, a funeral, birthday party, uh, city events, food that had been sacrificed to idols was everywhere, even in the workforce. And the Corinthians were flaunting their freedom in Christ, saying, we're free in Christ now. It doesn't matter what we eat. And what was happening, they were destroying the faith of some of their brothers and sisters uh, because some of the Corinthians were troubled that Christians would still participate in these things. And so Paul addresses them and says, you are destroying each other by the abuse of your rights. Now when we get to chapter 9, Paul is going to set himself up as an example for them to follow. He's going to show them how he uses his rights and liberties. Uh, so that's what we consider tonight. Uh, let's jump into 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Can I encourage you, as I normally do, uh, and it might be coming cliche, but please, if you have a Bible, uh, please open it up. There's so much to see. So uh, if you can fumble around now, whether you find your phone uh, or a Bible nearby, please open it up to 1 Corinthians chapter 9 so you can see these things uh, with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Paul writes, Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not the result of my work in the Lord? Even though I may not be an apostle to others, surely I am to you. For you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. This is my defense to those who sit in judgment on me. Don't we have the right to food and drink? Don't we have the right to take a believing wife along with us, as do the other apostles and the Lord's brothers and Cephas? Or is it only I and Barnabas who must work for a living? Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its grapes? Who tends a flock and does not eat of the milk or drink of the milk? Do I say this merely from a human point of view? Doesn't the law say the same thing? For it is written in the law of Moses, Do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain. Is it about oxen that God is concerned? Surely he says this for us, doesn't he? Yes, this was written for us. Because when the plowman plows and the thresher threshes, they ought to do so in the hope of sharing in the harvest. If we have sown spiritual seed among you, is it too much if we receive or reap a material harvest from you? If others have this right of support from you, shouldn't we have it all the more? But we did not use this right. On the contrary, we put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. Don't you know that those who work in the temple get their food from the temple? And those who serve at the altar share in what is offered on the altar? In the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. But I have not used any of these rights. And I'm not writing this in the hope that you will do such things for me. I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of this boast. Yet when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast, for I'm compelled to, pre to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. If I preach voluntarily, I have a reward. If not voluntarily, I am simply discharging the trust to me. What then is my reward? Just this, that in preaching the gospel, I may offer it free of charge and so not make use of my rights in preaching it. 
Though I am free and belong to no man, I make myself a slave to everyone, to win as many as possible. To the Jews I became like a Jew, to win the Jews. To those under the law I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law I became like one not having the law, though I'm not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To those weak, I became weak, to win the weak. I've become all things to all men, so that by all possible means I may save some. I do this all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. Do you not know that in a race all runners run, but but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. No, I beat my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. This is the Lord's word. Let's pray and ask Uh, him for his blessing upon our time. We need uh, his help in all things. Our Father, we come before you uh, in the circumstances that we find ourselves in. Uh, But Lord, despite everything, you are ruling and reigning and you are still speaking to us through your word There are so many riches found in your word, the wisdom of God, the will of God. It's all found here. We thank you for this precious time that we can just come aside and and retreat, as it were, from everything and sit at the feet of Christ. I pray you would speak to us now. And Lord, as I unleash arrows out tonight, may you direct the arrows to find the gaps in the armor. May the arrows sink deep into our hearts. May you convict and may you, may you be working and, 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 and changing us for your glory. I pray for the precious and necessary ministry of the Holy Spirit. May he attend the preaching of the word tonight. And may he attend each heart that it might be able to receive the word of God with faith and all meekness. And I pray, O oh God that you may save some and that you may build your church even tonight. Lord, we ask for your help. I need your help. And we pray to you these things now in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Chapter 9. Firstly, let us see our first point, the rights of an apostle and minister. The rights of an apostle and minister. Now, Paul is going to defend his position as an apostle, his office as apostle, and he is going to lay out all the rights that he has as an apostle and minister. Now, he does this to show the Corinthians how he lives and how he uses his rights. And the goal of that will be to give them an example so that they can imitate him, so that they can use their rights as he uses his rights. Now, our first point is in verses 1 uh, to 14, and we see a series of arguments to make uh, this defense first. Verse 1, he gives us four questions, or he presents four questions to them. Let's look at verse 1. He says, Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not the result of my work in the Lord? And the answer to all of those questions is yes. An obvious, yes, he is free. He is an apostle. He has seen Jesus on the road to Damascus. And they are the fruit of his labors. Yes, yes, yes. But Paul, despite all this, he still had his critics. As if he wasn't a genuine apostle because he didn't belong to the original 12 apostles that followed Christ during Christ's ministry. And so because he wasn't like the original 12, he had his critics And the way that he conducted his ministry, he had his critics. And yet Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, the ascended Jesus, did appear to Paul and commissioned him. And and look what else, verse 2. Even though I may not be an apostle to others, surely I am to you. For you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. 
You see, before Paul got to Corinth, it wasn't a city full of Christians. There weren't Christians there. All that was in Corinth were idol-worshipping, hell-destined pagans. That's who resided in that city before Paul got there. What happened? How, how was the church born? What does Paul say? Are you not the result of my work in the Lord? Acts chapter 18 tells us that Paul had stayed in Corinth for 18 months. He evangelized there. He preached and witnessed. And then he won converts to the power of the gospel. He discipled them. He trained them. He taught them. And he planted a church. And so these former pagans who were living in Corinth were transported and were taken and snatched off the broad way that leads to destruction and were placed onto the narrow path that leads to life everlasting through the powerful gospel that Paul preached to them. It was through his ministry. But note he qualifies it. He says, are you not the result of my work in the Lord? He qualifies this because he's going to spend so much of this chapter talking about us being soul winners, winning people for Christ. But he qualifies it and says, it was my work in the Lord. I labored, God saved. Remember in chapter 3 what he said, I planted the seed, God gave the growth. So Paul defends his God-given apostolic position and his defense continues with the rights that he was entitled to as an apostle and a minister. Now remember the context. The Corinthians were defending their right to eat whatever they wanted and to live how they wanted because they were free in Christ. Paul lays out all the rights that he's entitled to. And look, look what he does in verses 3 to 6. This is my defense to those who sit in judgment on me. Don't we have the right to food and drink? Don't we have the right to take a believing wife along with us, as do the other apostles and the Lord's brothers and Cephas? Or is it only I and Barnabas who must work for a living? Now he gives these different scenarios of ministry, and he gives us scenarios, and each of them relate to the minister being compensated and supported materially for their ministry. He says, don't I have a right for all my ministry to food and drink to have these things provided for me? Don't, don't I have a right to bring along a Christian wife into the ministry with me? And, and, and don't I have the right for her to be supported as well as me by those that I'm ministering to? Because the apostles' wives and the apostles are supported financially. Even the Lord Jesus' brothers who are in ministry now, them and their wives are supported. Even Peter, the apostle Peter Cephas, he and his wife are supported in the ministry. And yet, do I and Barnabas not have this right? Are we the only ones that have to work a second job just so that we can live while we minister? Do we have to have two jobs? He's defending the right for gospel ministers to be paid for their work. Now to highlight this, to, to highlight how obvious and right this is, he gives three everyday uh, life examples just to highlight how obvious this should be to them. Verse 7, have a look at it. Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its grapes? Who tends a flock and does not drink of the milk? Now, three very clear examples. The soldier at war, does, does, does he not have his needs provided for? Does he need to engage in warfare and also work a second job simultaneously? No, of course not. His rations, his gear, his weaponry, his food is all supplied. Because he's engaged in the fight, because he is fighting, he is entitled to have all these things supplied to him. It's obvious. And he's provided for so that he can best fight in the battle. The, the second illustration is equally easy to understand. The person who plants a vineyard, do they labor planting and planting and creating this great vineyard and yet not get any share in the crops, uh, in, in the fruit that is born from it? Of course they get to eat of the grapes and the fruit of the vineyard that they plant. Obviously they reap from what they've sown. And what about thirdly, he says, the shepherd. Doesn't the shepherd get some of the milk from his flock? I mean, he looks after them day and night, taking care of them, protecting them. Does he not, uh, is he not entitled to be nourished from the milk they provide? It's so obvious. It's clear. The, the, these illustrations, they're not controversial. 
They're obvious. The soldier, the planter, the shepherd, they're all entitled to be supported and nourished by their labors. And yet Paul's saying, is the minister, am I as a minister of the gospel and not, uh, not entitled to be supported with a wage for my labors? Isn't it interesting that these three illustrations, these three category of workers, are they not a fitting description that best describe the life of a minister of the gospel? Doesn't this describe pastors and preachers? Are they not those who lead the front line of Christian soldiers in the spiritual war that we're engaging? Our gospel ministers, are they not those who labor in God's vineyard? We sow the seed, we plant, and we water. And our ministers of the gospel, are they not shepherds of God's flock? It's very clear what Paul is doing here. And Paul has proven his point that he should be entitled. He is entitled to be supported financially for his labors. And he argues that from society. Society proves this. And yet Paul isn't done making his point. He now backs it up with a scriptural command. Look at, the, look at how he backs it up from scripture, verses 8 to 10. Do I say this merely from a human point of view? Doesn't the law say the same thing? For it is written in the law of Moses. Do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain. Is it about oxen that God is concerned? Surely he says this for us, doesn't he? Yes, this was written for us. Now, this is a very strange passage to quote, right? Deuteronomy 25 verse 4, Paul is quoting here. And it's talking about a, a command that God gives to his people regarding oxen. Oxen that are laboring. And God wants them to be cared for. Now, the scenario is when an ox is stamping and treading out grain so that it can be used for food and for, and for meals. When the oxen is treading out the grain, do not put a muzzle on its mouth. The work is laborious. It is strenuous. And the animal will get tired and hungry. Do not cover his mouth while he's doing all this work. Let him eat some of the grain that he is stepping on and working so hard to produce. God's saying, don't muzzle him. And God's point is, don't starve the beast that is providing your next meal. And Paul says the point of this command is obvious. It's highlighting, if God cares this much just for an animal, how much more does he care for ministers of the gospel, for those who work and labor, for anyone who works in whatever field? Paul makes a great point, but he's still not done cementing his point. He gives an example of ministers in the Old Testament. Look at the example that he gives next, verse 13. Don't you know that those who work in the temple get their food from the temple and those who serve at the altar share in what is offered on the altar? Now, this is a reference to the Levites and the priests. Their job was working in the tabernacle, working in the temple, making the sacrifices, preparing everything, keeping the incense burning. All of those things, that was their job. And how were they compensated? Some of the animal that was sacrificed on the altar, some of that was given to them as their food portion. Some of the tithes and the offering and the tax was given to them to pay for them and their families. This has been God's way of caring for his ministers. Paul, Paul's giving so many points. And yet he feels the need to give yet one more point to cement his case. And this time... He brings the Lord Jesus into the discussion. Read verse 14. In the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. He says, Jesus has commanded that those who preach the gospel should earn a living, their living, from the gospel. Now, when did Jesus command this? Well, uh, you remember in Luke chapter 10 when God sends out the 72 disciples and he says, tells them, don't bring supplies with you. When you move from house to house, witnessing about the kingdom and preaching, when you move from house to house, stay where you are there because they shall provide for your needs. And Jesus, the quote is, he says there in Luke 10, for the worker deserves his wages. 
Paul says here, the Lord Jesus has commanded this, has ordered it. The Lord Jesus has commanded his church to financially support its ministers of the gospel. Now we have to ask the question, why has God laid out this rule? Why has Jesus given this command? Because God wants those who minister in the gospel to be fully and completely devoted to their work and to their labor. It's not The ministry is not to be seen as a mere side job, a mere side kind of thing. Because when you work a second, to have to work a second job on top of the gospel ministry prevents you from the work that you need to do. It prevents a gospel minister being able to labor and study under the word of God, to study it and to mine the scriptures. It prevents them from visiting the needy, visiting the sick. It prevents them from discipling. It pre- prevents them from devoting themselves to prayer and intercession for the people of God. A second job will do that. In 1 Timothy 5.17, Paul calls the gospel ministry labor and says those who do it should be paid. In in 5 verse 17, he says those who labor in preaching and teaching, literally labor. It is agonizing over a text. It is crying out to God over the text. It is pleading for God in preparation. Oh God, give me a message for the people that I may feed your sheep. And proclaim your word. It is a wrestling with God. And when such wrestling happens, the minister has no right. When he doesn't do that, he has no right to ascend the pulpit. Spurgeon said this about the labor of the ministry. Let me quote Spurgeon. If any man will preach as he should preach, his work will take more out of him than any other labor under heaven. End quote. So much preaching doesn't seem that way today. It doesn't seem laborious because it's so diluted. It's so soft. It's so neat. It's so cute. It's not labor at all. It's nothing more than a year seven PowerPoint presentation. But it should be labor. And so what's the point here? What is application? Let me say this. It's not comfortable saying this as a minister. But what is the point from God's word here? If you belong to a local church where you worship God and you are fed the word of God, then the Lord Jesus has commanded you to financially support your pastors and their families. And understand, even Brooke and myself have an obligation to support the pastors and ministries here financially, the gospel work that happens. It's our responsibility so that those who labor in the gospel can do so to the best way possible, as best as they can. So that's our first point. Paul lays out the rights of an apostle and minister, a wage to be financially supported for their labors. But next, next we see uh, the point is, uh, a second point is the surrender of these rights for souls. The surrender of rights for souls. Paul has reminded them of his rightful entitlement, but now he wants to remind them of something else. Something else. Look at verse 15. But I have not used any of these rights. These rights to being paid and supported. I have not used any of these rights. And he's not saying all of these things that we've just covered so that they will start paying him. Look at the rest of verse 15. But I have not used any of these rights, and I'm not writing this in the hope that you will do such things for me. I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of this boast. He refuses to be paid. He refuses. He surrenders this right. Why does he surrender so important a right that he is entitled to? Why does he surrender it? Some pastors are tremendously wealthy already business in backgrounds or have uh, come across great inheritance or whatever and they're incredibly wealthy so they have chosen to not accept a wage from their congregations and that's very generous from them others pastor congregations so small and so little or just a very new small church that they can't be fully supported because of uh, the few people that are there Uh, this isn't paul's reason this wasn't the reason for paul what is the reason look back at verse 12 
the middle of verse 12. We did not use this right to be paid. On the contrary, we put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. What's Paul's reason? He doesn't want to hinder the gospel of Christ. Now we have to ask, how does receiving a wage, how might receiving a wage for ministry hinder the gospel work of Christ? How may it be hindrance? Well, people who may have considered listening to Paul's message may have been turned off and may have walked away if they found out that there were hidden clauses in in listening to the message about Christ, that there were strings attached, hidden fees in order to come and listen to this great message. It's going to cost you financially. People might be deterred if they hear that it comes with fees. Look at verse 18. This is the issue, Paul's saying. What then is my reward? Just this, that in preaching the gospel, I may offer it free of charge and so not make use of my rights in preaching it. You see, in our world, we know what it's like. There are lots of good things out there for us that we often have to pass by because of the costs associated with them. We just can't do it because of the cost. Paul didn't want that to be the case of the preaching of the gospel. He didn't want people to miss out because there was a fee attached to it. He didn't want people to think that it was just some money grab scheme, this traveling preacher. Paul doesn't want, to be, doesn't want anyone turned off by money. And he doesn't want poor people to miss out because they don't think they can afford coming and hearing. This is what he's getting at here. He wants to give the gospel free of charge. Free of charge, he says. And it's absolutely wonderful. His heart and motivation. But we have to ask, how can Paul possibly su- survive and live if he ministers free of charge? How can he do it? Well, Acts chapter 18 verse 3 tells us that Paul committed himself to working also as a tent maker. In order to survive while ministering, he worked a second job and funded his own ministry through tent making. Now, tent making, let us not get a romantic modern kind of view of this. This was not a cruisy kind of part-time few hours job. It was very difficult. Tents back then were made from leather. And, and, and to work with leather, leather there was very, very heavy and hard to maneuver. It was a hard material to work with. On top of that, uh, leather had a terrible, terrible odor. And, 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 more, and more than that, le- working with leather in those contexts was extremely unhygienic. Paul Barnett, let me quote him, he says this, Quote, most likely Paul's hand and arms were permanently stained. Such was the kind of work. Now, this kind of work too, so laborious, uh, ministering during the day and also working simultaneously, a hard job brought physical exhaustion to Paul. And it also brought reproach upon him because it wasn't an esteem trade. People didn't think very highly of him. But this was Paul's commitment. When he writes again to the Corinthians later, he reminds them of this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 9, he says this, And when I was in need whilst with you, I was not a burden to anyone. He suffered great need during his ministry because of this sacrifice of a wage. He would, he would minister and minister and minister to them. And often he would go back to where he was sleeping without a meal waiting for him without any food or without proper clothing to endure the elements. And he suffered great need, and yet he wasn't a burden to any of them. He did not ask anything of the Corinthians because he wanted to proclaim the gospel free of charge. And that's why he says in verse 15, rather than being putting any hindrance to the gospel, rather we endure anything. For the sake of the gospel, whether suffering need or working day and night in a second job to fund it myself. We put up with anything. And we have to ask, how could Paul be so devoted to the gospel of Christ like this? How could he be so devoted? Well, there was something about Paul that was so different to so many pastors and preachers and teachers and ministers today. There was something so different about him. Did you spot it in verse 16 when we did the Bible reading? Look at the difference. I wish I could spend the whole sermon on this one verse. Truly, 
Verse 16 Here's a difference. Yet when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast for I am compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. Two huge huge statements in that verse about Paul. He was compelled to preach, he says. And woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. Let, let me just, let's just look at those two statements for a second. Firstly, he says, I am compelled to preach. Literally in the Greek, necessity is laid upon me to preach. I have to preach. I've got no, off, no options. It's kind of like the prophets of old. You remember Jonah? He refused to be God's messenger. So God sent a messenger to him, the great fish, and it swallowed him up just to show him that he had no choice in this. Necessity was laid upon him. And you remember the prophet Jeremiah, when Jeremiah says, I didn't want to preach. I I tried to hold it in, but it was like a fire burning in my bones. I could not hold it in. I grew weary trying not to preach. Necessity is laid upon me. And Paul says, I can't boast. I have to preach. The divine vice is upon me and it grips me. I have to. Is it any any wonder why Paul called himself, Paul, a slave of Christ? The beginning of his letters. A slave of Christ. I have to. And the second statement that he says is, Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. There was a fate worse than death for Paul. He was not afraid of dying. He was not afraid of becoming a martyr for Christ, but he was afraid of failing to fulfill his calling to preach the gospel. He feared that, not death. And do you see, this is what characterized Paul. Do you see how different he is than than so many ministers today? What a chasm, what a difference. Pastoring and ministry today is seen as this good career option to take. Why not try it out? Paul says, woe is me if I don't preach the gospel. And yet, pulpits today are filled with men and women now who cannot relate to that statement in the slightest. Woe to me if I do not preach. And this kind of burden, this kind of divine summoning and vice, it's no longer a requirement for the pulpit anymore, for ministry. What's the requirement? Do you have any kind of certificate from college? Do you have vision for the church, a vision to lead us forward? Do you have any charisma? Is the person likable or relatable? Are they a nice guy? Are they a good communicator? When prospective pastors are interviewed, they should be asked the following question. Can you see yourself doing anything else apart from the ministry? And if a prospective pastor was asked that question, what should the response be? What do you mean? Can I see myself doing anything else? What are you talking about? I am here before you because I cannot do anything else. I cannot but preach the gospel. This is what I have to do. I must do it. I must preach or die. What a difference. And yet that's not the state of the majority of pulpits today. Not from what I've seen and heard. Let me quote Spurgeon again in these matters. He says, quote, I always say to young fellows who consult me about the ministry, don't be a minister if you can help it. Because if the man can help it, God has never called him. But if he cannot help it and he must preach or die, then he is the man. End quote. Now what's the point? Why Why am I saying all this? Now do you see why Paul could surrender his greatest needs and rights and entitlements? He loved Christ. He lived for the gospel. He wanted it to be free of charge. He didn't want anyone to miss out. He had to preach and he wanted it to be free for all, despite the cost it would have for his own life. He wanted everyone to hear it. Preaching the gospel free, he says, to preach it freely. And this is remarkable about Paul's ministry. This is what's remarkable. Paul could preach a gospel about the sovereign, free grace of God in Jesus Christ and he could preach it free of charge. He could do that. 
You see, the free salvation that we receive, it's freely received by us, but it costs Jesus everything. Everything. And now, Paul gave a free ministry to the people in Corinth. It was free for the Corinthians, but it cost him everything. Do you see how Paul's life adorned the gospel of Jesus Christ? It adorned it. We see surrendering rights for souls. Thirdly, I want us to see surrendering our lives for souls. Surrendering our lives for souls. We've just seen Paul give up his rights so that the gospel can be available to everyone. So that all who are lost can hear now he shows that he gave so much he gave up so much more than just his rights he gave up more to win them to Christ look at verse 19 though i am free and belong to no man i make myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible paul he's not a slave he doesn't have any huge human master he's a free man And yet he gives up his freedom and says, I make myself a slave to all people. And what was the goal? To win them, to win souls. I enslave myself to them to win them. Now he's going to show how uh, how that works in a moment. But he gives examples of the kind of people that he makes himself a slave to. And he gives examples how he makes himself a slave to these people. Look at the first group he makes himself a slave to. Verse 20. To the Jews I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law. So as to win those under the law. Who's the first group that Paul becomes a slave to? To Jews. To the Jews he says, I become like a Jew. Now hold on a second. Uh, That makes no sense, right? Paul, how can you become a Jew if you are already a Jew? You can't become what you already are. What's he saying here? Well, he qualifies it. To those who are under the law, I became like one under the law. Since becoming a Christian, Paul was liberated, liberated from the law and its control upon him. From rituals, he was liberated from the ceremonial laws, from food customs, from feasts, from traditions, from rituals, from the traditions of men. He was liberated from those things because they were fulfilled in Christ. Fulfilled in Christ. And yet, Paul was willing to accommodate to Jews if it meant an open opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. He was willing willing to take along and adopt some outdated outdated rituals and some outdated customs if it meant an open door for the gospel that he could walk through. He was willing to do that even to the extreme. Acts chapter 16, he was going on a missionary journey with Timothy, but Timothy being Gentile wasn't circumcised. He wouldn't have been allowed in the synagogues even to open up his mouth. Paul circumcises Timothy just so when they got there that he could say he is a circumcised man so that the Jews would listen to him. It wasn't for salvation, but so that he could speak to these Jews. He became a slave to them. Look at the second group, verse 21. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law. Though I am not free from God's law, but I am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. Who are those not having the law? Well, it's obvious, the Gentiles. He became like a Gentile to the Gentiles to win them. But he qualifies it. I, I, am, I am not under the law anymore as it were, but I'm still under Christ's law. I'm still under Christ's law. I'm not a lawless man. Not everything goes, but he became like a Gentile to the Gentiles. He did not push his Jewish heritage. He didn't boast in that. He didn't try to make Gentiles like Jews. He didn't boast in customs. He didn't try to change their customs. He lived as one of them when he was with them in the midst of a pagan and wicked city. He lived among them and he was willing to forfeit any customs or traditions he had for the sake of them. And yet while he lived among them, he didn't participate in their sinful practices of idolatry and sexual immorality. I'm still under the law of Christ, but I became like a Gentile to them so I could win them. 
And look at the third group, group three, verse 22. To the weak I became weak to win the weak. This is Paul becoming weak to the weak so as to win them. This is the lower class. This is the marginalized. These are the downtrodden. These are the weak, the addicted, the helpless, the outcasts. Paul never sought to just target the elite because he wasn't after a wage, right? He could preach to everyone. He could spend time with the weak because he didn't need the richest money. And he spent with them. He bore their burdens. He evangelized in the trenches. He came not with status. He didn't do that, but associated with the lowly. And he didn't throw his authority around. And Paul, the point in all of this, these three examples of people that he made himself a slave to, Paul did this all for them to provide opportunities to share the gospel. Here's his point. The gospel is offensive in and of itself. It says that we're so sinful that the only right and fitting punishment for us is eternity in hell. That's how sinful we are, the gospel says. But it also says that God loved us and sent his only son to die on the cross and pay for our sins. And then he rose again and he's the Lord of all and he's been made judge of all. And if you believe in him, you'll be saved. But there's no other savior, just one. The gospel is offensive in and of itself. So Paul says, every other offense, I tried to, to get rid of it, to move every other thing out of the way because the gospel is offensive enough. I'll do whatever it takes. The gospel is offensive enough. All of this, understand, this slavery and accommodating, it was all pre-evangelism work. It was all pre-evangelism work so that he could have an open door. Verse 22, it says there, I have become all things to all men so that by all possible means I might save some. Now, there is a modern tragedy with this. This is an abused, 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 abused passage from modern, the modern so-called church today. It has been so abused. This thing where Paul says, I've become all things to all men so that by all means I might win some. It has been so abused. that th This verse has been used to justify turning our church services into concerts. It's been used to justify the reason why so many people don't talk about hell today. It's used to justify evangelism that goes something like this. Jesus loves you so much. He's got a wonderful plan of your life. Will you accept him into your heart? It's used to justify worldliness. It's used to justify feminism and homosexuality in the church. It's the reason why modern preaching and modern Christian songs call us broken and not wretches anymore. This verse has been justified, has been used to justify so much worldliness in the church to entertain goats. Why? Why, why, why is all this happening in the church? Well, well like Paul. So as to win as many as, the, as many as possible, by any means possible to win them, that is to molest the word of God. God's word doesn't mean that. That passage doesn't mean that. Paul never watered down the gospel. Paul never diluted the message. Paul never broke the commands of scripture to reach a certain goal or end. Because the New Testament, his own writings as well, give us very clear instructions on how God says we are to worship and how we are to gather as a church. And how we are to evangelize. He never did that. Paul became a slave and, did, and, and, and tried all things so as to win as many as possible. So if it doesn't mean these things, what the modern church has sought to do and abuse a passage. If the passage doesn't mean that, then what does it mean to become a slave to all and by all means possible win them to Christ? What does it mean? Well, let me give an example probably the clearest illustration story that I can give to show you what this does look like. In 1732, there was a Christian community with Moravians in them. And these, these Moravians heard that there was an island in the West Indies where there was an atheist British slave owner. And on this island, the British slave owner had somewhere between 2,000 to 3,000 slaves. 
This atheist slave owner was so hostile to God, no preachers, no missionaries, no evangelists were allowed onto the island. If a missionary or evangelist shipwrecked onto the island, they would be locked away and kept away from the people so as not to preach. This is how hard and this atheist slave owner was. Well, two young Moravians in the Christian community far away heard of the plight of all these thousands of slaves who would spend their whole lives on that island without hearing of Christ and would eventually die and go to hell. They heard this plight. And so what did these two young men do? There was only one way to reach them. They decided that they would voluntarily sell themselves into slavery to get onto that island so that they could live among the people and evangelize to them. Lifelong slavery. And, and the recount goes of this great event. As the two young men got on the boat to leave their Christian community, they set sail and as they were starting to move away, the community came to the shoreline, the community, their Christian community, to wave them goodbye. And, and it says that there were people in the community, family members, relatives, friends who were crying and crying and thinking, should they do this? This is far too great a sacrifice to make just to evangelize. And when the two young men saw the tears as they were drifting away on the boat, it says they linked arms, raised their hands in the sky and said, shall not the lamb receive the full reward of all he suffered? And they went to the West Indies and sold themselves into slavery. And what happened? Many more Moravians ended up doing the same. 18 of them went across 13 of the 18 died over there of disease, including one of those two men who were the first to go across. One of those two young men died from disease. And yet more, more of them came across, more missionaries came across selling themselves into slavery. In that same year, another seven died. More kept coming, selling themselves in so that they could preach the gospel to these, to these slaves there. This is what it means. This is what it means to make ourselves a slave to all people and use all possible means to win them with the gospel. It means to give up our lives. It doesn't mean to entertain goats. It doesn't mean to turn church into a concert. It doesn't mean to water down the gospel. It means to lay down our lives for the lost. That's what Paul did. It is like Paul. What did Paul do? He sought to imitate Christ. What did Christ do? He emptied himself. He became the servant and slave of all. And in love, he laid down his life for us. He died for our sins so that we could be liberated. That, my friends, that is the kind of evangelism the world needs from the church today. That's what is needed. That's what it means. This is what it is. Paul surrendered his rights and he surrendered his life. Well, lastly tonight, as we are quickly out of time, let us quickly see the last point. The last point is forget not our own souls. We must forget not our own souls in all of this. Paul has spoken much about winning the lost through sacrifice of rights, reaching the lost, but he warns we must not neglect the eternity of our, own, of our own souls. He is concerned for the Corinthians, the way they're behaving, that they may be shut out of heaven, that they may be lost forever. And so he sets himself up again with a hypothetical situation. And he says, the, the situation, verses 24, as I'm summarizing it, he says, imagine I've won a multitude to heaven and yet I myself am disqualified from entrance. And he goes on, and he goes on and gives this. And he wants them to do some self-examination. And so he talks in verses 24 to 27. He says, he starts talking about athletes and a race. And he makes it extremely personal. He, li he likens the Christian life to a race and a fight. And the Corinthians could all understood this. They were very familiar with sporting events such as racing and fighting. And he says to them, run in such a way as to win the prize. Run. Who are the ones that win the Olympics? The fanatics. The ones that give their life. The ones that deny everything that will hinder them from reaching the goal. Paul says, look at verse 25. 
Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. Now, the NIV there is way too casual in how it translates the Greek. Literally, the Greek there is uh, the athlete, the one who enters into the games, exercises self-control in every way or uh, has self-control and abstains in every way. We know the famous slogan that gyms and fitness wear have no pain, no gain. Famous, we all know that saying. It is, we know those who are into athletics and those who are into the gym, those who are into the, to the Olympics, they deny their body from being lazy and, and, and excessive sleeping. They deny themselves this. They deny cravings, sweets, takeaway foods, alcohol, all of these things they deny themselves. It's great self-denial. But also, no pain for gain also means you go into harsh treatment of the body. It means you run, you exercise, you are in it daily. Rain, hail or shine, you are there working strenuous exercise to reach the goal. And Paul says, so to the Christian. And Paul sets himself up as an example. As an example. He says, I pummeled my body. I beat my body into subjection and make it my slave. I don't live according to my urges. I make my body submit to the commands and will of God. And I beat my body, he says, discipline. And this is being unapologetic with our sinful tendencies. Remember, Jesus says, if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Oh, don't be friendly with sinful desires. Work hard. And he gives them two motivations for watching over their souls ruthlessly. One of them is positive and one of them is negative. The positive motivation he gives is he reminds them of of their reward. What does he say? Athletes run and do all of this for a crown that perishes, but we do it for an imperishable crown. He's saying, athletes, they give up so much. They work so hard. They go through all this pain for gain. And what do they gain? A wreath of leaves. A wreath of leaves. Is that what we run for? Is that what we've signed up for? No, Paul says, we run and fight for the everlasting. For what is everlasting? And what is at the finish line for us? It's not a wreath of leaves. What is at the finish line of us? Redeemed bodies, free from sin, all sorrow taken and wiped away. What's waiting at the finish line? Paradise. What's waiting? Jesus Christ is waiting there for us. What's waiting at the finish line? We will see God face to face. This is what awaits us. This is what is before us. Is it too good? Is it too good? This motivation, isn't it wonderful? It's positive motivation, but now he has negative motivation, a second motivation in the negative. He says, I beat my body into subjection, so after preaching to others, I myself am not disqualified. What's the other motivation? Disqualification. Disqualification. To profess Christ, but to live like the world. To say that you are a runner, but you never run. The motivation is being locked out of heaven and missing out. You know, you talk to people today, are you a Christian? Are you going to heaven? Yes, I'm a Christian. I ask Jesus into my heart and I go to church. What did Paul say about his faith? Paul said in Galatians 2.20, he said, he said this, I trust only in Christ and the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son who gave his life for me. He loved me and he gave himself for me. I live by faith in him. I'm trusting in him. I'm pressing on in him. Paul's saying, do not be deceived. Mere entrance into the race doesn't guarantee finish. Is that not true? Starting the race doesn't guarantee finish. Jesus taught about this with the parable of the soils. So many started off, but they fell away. They fell away. They proved that they hadn't become athletes made by God. They fell away. My, my, my challenge to you is, can athletes be devoted for nothing? Be so devoted for nothing. And yet we who have eternity before us, can we be apathetic and indifferent? Athletes, they run on a nice track. We run on a road that is filled with lions. And dare we sleep? 
Because our adversary doesn't sleep. He's looking whom he can devour. Should we sleep? Listen, before us is heaven and hell. Beyond the finish line is heaven and hell. One of them will have us. One of them will have us. I close and, and, and say to you, on behalf of Paul, Paul says, give yourselves, give up your lives to give the glorious gospel to others. Give yourselves to this task and keep careful watch over yourselves that you are not found to be a hypocrite and not truly a runner. Or that we would hear God's word tonight. I trust God has spoken to each of us and may the Lord bless the preaching of his word. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this passage. We thank you for the truth contained in it. We thank you that you have spoken. We thank you that it's so relevant for our lives. I pray that, I pray that each person listening would take the instruction and the word proclaimed tonight, that we would take it to heart. May, may those who are lost May they turn and put their faith in Christ and those who call themselves Christians. May we not say that we are runners, but may we run, run to receive the prize and not miss out on eternity with you, the forgiveness of sins. Lord, I pray these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. May you build your church. Amen. May the Lord bless you as you think through these things and seek to apply them. Amen.